Welcome to All Things Cardio-Oncology. This is the podcast of the International Cardio-Oncology Society. My name is Steve Caselli. I'm the Executive Director of ICOS, and we have a full virtual studio today. In addition to my co-host, Dr. Arjun Ghosh, we are joined today by Dr. Susanna Stanway. Susanna has been on the show before, and also Dr. Rebecca Dobson. We're going to hear from them about a new guideline which they have co-authored and which was just published in Jack Cardio-Oncology last month. So congratulations to all of you on this excellent piece of work. And before we turn to the guideline, I wonder if each of you could just introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about where you're serving currently and how you got involved in this project. So Dr. Ghosh, as my co-host, why don't you begin? Thanks, Steve. So I'm a consultant cardiologist at Barts Heart Centre and University College London Hospital, and I lead the cardio-oncology service at UCLH. Great. And Dr. Stanway? Uh, My name is Susanna Stanway. I am a consultant medical oncologist who until recently was working at the Royal Marsden Hospital in the Institute of Cancer Research in London. I'm currently taking a little bit of time out. I've got a a long-standing interest in um, cancer survivorship and specifically um, cardio-oncology, hence my involvement with this work. Great. Well, welcome back. It's good to have you again. And Dr. Dobson. Hi, I'm Rebecca Dobson. I'm a consultant cardiologist in Liverpool in the north of the UK. Um, I run the uh, regional cardio-oncology service here, um, hence my involvement with the guideline. Excellent. Well, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for taking some time with us today. So the title of this guideline that we want to consider today is the British Society of Echocardiography and the British Cardio-Oncology Society Guideline for Transthoracic Echocardiographic Assessment of Adult Cancer Patients Receiving Anthracyclines and and or Trastuzumab. Catchy title. Let's begin by unpacking that a little bit. Um, Maybe Arjun, could you uh, tell us uh, how how this guideline came about? It seems like it's a fairly narrowly focused guideline. Tell us something of the background and uh, why you all thought this was needed. Thanks, Steve. So as you say, it is is a very focused guideline and um, we purposely decided to start small and actually, this is actually a big area of cancer in the UK. The, uh, there are no guidelines in the UK prior to this on cardio-oncology, and we know that many of our breast cancer patients and many of the hematological cancer patients will be exposed to anthracyclines and a lot of the breast cancer and some other cancer patients exposed to trastuzumab as well. These are drugs commonly used in many hospitals. So we felt that using um, these uh, drugs as the basis for this guideline would be quite relevant to many practicing oncologists and also to many practicing cardiologists. This is why we wanted to start off the UK guideline process with uh, this topic. Excellent. I should have said, um, Dr. Ghosh, is one of the co-authors, and I believe you have some follow-up questions for your other co-authors here with us today. Uh, Yes, uh, indeed. So I think um, we've kind of just introduced uh, why we we wrote the guidelines, but I guess in the following questions, we'll try and get a bit more of an understanding regarding this. And I'll really be wanting to get the cardiologist's uh, opinion from Rebecca and the oncologist's opinion from Susanna and really just show how, you know, cardio-oncology is really a true collaboration between both cardiologists and, and oncologists. So following on from Steve's question, maybe if I could ask that, Um, Although there haven't been that many UK guidelines, as in this is the first, there have been cardio-oncology guidelines outside of the UK. So why do you think that um, there was the requirement to introduce uh, this guideline uh, in the UK? Why couldn't we have just used something um, that's already been published? So maybe, uh, Rebecca, if I could start with you for this one. Yeah, thanks, Arjun. It's a really good question. And you rightly say there are, there are lots of guidelines on this topic around the world. And it's a it's a contentious area. You read 10 guidelines and you get 10 slightly different opinions and points of view. And I think we felt that um, 
nationally in the UK, we wanted a guideline that wasn't just for oncologists or cardiologists, but that was a more multidisciplinary focus. So this guideline is aimed at the people who are on the coalface who are performing the echocardiograms. And we, we wanted to provide the physiologists with a guideline that would help them acquire high quality images and be able to deal with those images appropriately. And I think that this guideline specifically caters for that um, group of, of uh, healthcare professionals. Okay, thanks. And um, Susanna, from your point of view, um, how do you think that, you know, this guideline will, will help um, oncologists? So I think it's really important for oncologists to have an understanding of cardio-oncology. I mean, just taking one step back, this is about anthracyclines and trastuzumab, as has already been said, and they're both really active drugs um, that we use for women with breast cancer. And breast cancer is a, a huge global problem. One person dies every minute um, from breast cancer. Um, and around 20% of women with breast cancer have got HER2 positive um, breast cancer and will be exposed to targeted therapies such as trastuzumab. And about a third of women um, who have breast cancer will receive chemotherapy um, at, at some point. So um, it, it's, it's really, really important. And I think if we're using these drugs, we've got to know what the toxicity, potential toxicity readout is and, and how we manage that. And we've got to make sure that we've got proper collaborations with our cardiology colleagues so that we're managing um, these patients as, as best as we can. And th this is important for many reasons. Um, as I've said, I think if we're giving drugs, we need to know what the problems can be and, and how they can be managed, but also having delays in oncology treatment or not being able to give the treatments can have really detrimental effects on, on, on breast cancer outcomes. Um, and we know that from published data. So giving tr the, the correct um, effective treatment in a timely fashion is really important. And I think that guidelines such as this will enable that to happen more often. Okay. And do you think that um, this is going to be problematic to implement in clinical practice for oncologists? Because often with guidelines and especially from bodies that maybe you're not that familiar with or organizations that you're not that familiar with, um, it can be problematic in implementing it on a day-to-day -day basis. So is that going to be the case here for oncologists? And um, you know, if that is the case, how best can this be overcome? So I think that there's certainly an education um, piece of work to be done here. And I think that, <coughs> that these guidelines, along with others that have recently published, um, such as the baseline um, risk stratification guidelines that were, that were recently published, I think will empower oncologists to make some of these decisions in an along with their patients and have the knowledge as to when to refer people and when to potentially start patients on cardioprotective medications. So we know that not all patients need to be referred to, um, to a cardiologist, um, but the guidelines such as this, it, it will empower oncologists and will give them more, um, more of a knowledge base to know when and, and, and how to refer and also what kind of services and service level agreements need, need to be set up such that these patients are, are properly managed. Um, so no, I, th I think the setting up of these services in, you know, across the country and across the world is going to clearly take time. Um, but I think that it's, it's what should happen for, for, for best management. Okay, thanks. And um, Rebecca, really the same question to you. Um, what do you think this means for cardiologists and you've already alluded to the fact that a lot of physiologists will be using this guideline so what would it mean for echo departments? I think um, or I hope that for echo departments specifically this guideline will provide clarity where it's needed and also provide ammunition if you like that they can they can go to their local department and say look the British Society of Echocardiography is saying we should be using 3D and global longitudinal strain assessment in our cardio-oncology patients so if there are or we know that there are some cardiology departments that don't have access to these resources and I'm, I hope that this guideline will will help fight their corner so that they can have the kit that they need to provide um, or to deliver high quality echocardiography. Okay. And of course, the most important benefit is for the patient. So what, what should the patient, if they see this in the news that this new guideline has come out, what, what should it mean to them? I think as, as Susanna has alluded to, the, um, 
one of our main aims, both from the oncology side and the cardiology side, is to minimise interruptions to oncology therapy. And of course, there are always going to be circumstances where it is sadly necessary to interrupt treatment. But equally, we all know of, of many cases where patients have their cancer therapy interrupted, perhaps unnecessarily because they couldn't get the echo images or there was a discrepancy between this number or that number. And I think that if we're all following this guideline and, and using the, the methods of assessment that we recommend, then I, I hope that we'll have less interruptions to cancer therapy, which can only be a good thing for the patient. Yeah. And one of the roles of ICOS is to spread the word about cardio-oncology around the world. And one of the things that we noticed after the guideline was published, that there was a lot of buzz regarding the bi guideline from you know, different parts of the world. And there were a lot of comments on Twitter and other social media from uh, many countries. So why, why do you think that um, you know, this is the case, that you know, people from different countries have actually uh, looked at the guideline and felt that you know, this is of interest to them? Maybe, um, Susanna, if uh, I could ask, uh, I'll start with you uh, for, for this question. Um, I think, um, I mean, I, I think it's probably re repeating some of the things that I've said before. I think that it's, it's reassuring when you're educated um, a, a, as a clinician um, about the drugs that you're giving and that you kn better know what problems could happen, what you need to be doing about them. And it's all in a sort of uniform standardized way. And then you have um, arrangements with other specialists near you who may know more about it than you that you can refer on to. And I think that that must be very reassuring for a patient to know that that's going to happen. Um, and I, I think sets of guidelines are, are, are very useful um, for clinicians around the world. So I can only imagine that if people are going to find it useful in, in high income countries, that they're going to find it useful in lower middle income countries as well. OK, so if I could maybe um, push you a little bit on, on that point, I mean, do, do you think that they, a, they could be fully applied in, in low income countries or should people pick and choose uh, what they can access locally? I mean, how best can, can they be applied there? I mean, I think one has to do what one can um, in whatever environment one's in. So I, I don't think you can make a set of rules for um, a particular country because you may well find that even in different areas in different countries, there's different there's access to different services. So I think that one has to do the best that one can to deliver evidence based effective care to the patient that you have in front of you um, yeah. just to do best that you can at the time. And I think that it's your responsibility as a clinician to lobby for these kind of services in your area if you were giving these drugs with these kind of toxicities. Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's small steps, but I think that this global movement is picking up and um, and, and pathways are improving everywhere. Great, thanks. And Rebecca, what are your thoughts um, on on this uh, same question? Um, I guess I'd echo what Susanna said. Uh, yes, there are there are resources or um, methods of of echo acquisition in the guideline which many people will not have access to. But we have to be aspirational for our patients. We have to 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 aim to deliver the best possible standard of care, um, whilst recognizing that that isn't possible everywhere. At least this guideline is wi widely distributed and everyone can see um, the benefit of these these um, echo methods. Great, okay. So coming towards the, the end of the, the questions now, I think, but um, Rebecca, what would you say should the take home messages be for um, cardiologists and also for the um, associated and allied healthcare professionals such as physiologists and anyone else who, who might want to read the uh, guideline? I think the, the main take-home message is that accurate assessment of LV function in this patient group is absolutely critical to decision making because the last thing we want to do or anyone wants to do is measure someone's ejection fraction incorrectly and then unnecessarily stop their cancer treatment. So that has to be the main take home message is that we need high quality images and high quality interpretation of those images to enable the best possible standard of care for the, for the patient. Um, in terms of um, for the, the wider sort of healthcare community, I think also that the uh, uh, 
a really important point is looking at the, the non-echocardiographic considerations, which we have touched on in this paper. And I, I like the way that we've we've managed to sort of take the, the, the healthcare professional through the journey, right from the beginning, the first patient assessment, all the way through to follow up um, and long-term screening. So I think that's another useful um, message in the guideline. Great. And do you think the, the targeted echo approach that has been introduced in, in this guideline, I mean, is that likely to, to catch on? And maybe you could just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I really hope it does catch on. And I'm aware that we were the first, um, this is the first guideline that's recommended this approach. So what we've said in the guideline is, is that if you've had your, your baseline echocardiogram and everything's completely normal and your patient comes back for their, their screening scan, perhaps three months down the line and they are well, they've got no new symptoms, then you don't need to repeat absolutely every picture and do an in-depth study. What you need to do is an in-depth targeted study focusing on LV and RV systolic function. Um, so I really like this idea. I think it, it cuts down on unnecessary time, both for the person acquiring the images, but also for the patient, because we have to remember these patients are absolutely fed up of hospital appointments. They're coming and going to hospitals you know, far too often. Um, so anything we can do to, to reduce the, the time spent with us um, can only be a good thing. Thanks, Rebecca. And Susanna, again, same question to, to you. What, what should the take home message really be from the guideline for oncologists and other P, uh, allied healthcare professionals, specialists, oncology nurses and anyone else uh, reading the guideline? So I think, yes, I think it's just reaffirmation of sort of definitions of, of card, cardiotoxicity, potential possible cardiotoxicity, um, knowledge that there are other measurements that um, that can be made um, such as global longitudinal strain, 3D LVEF measurements and um, cardiac MRI if, if available. Um, knowing when to refer to a cardio-oncology service or to speak to a cardiologist if you haven't got a designated service to refer to. Um, and just, yes, knowledge about this evidence-based um, effective care. Um, I think that, that, that those are the most important messages really. Great. Thanks so much, Susanna. Uh, and I'll hand back to my co-host, uh, Steve, now. Thank you all uh, so much. Before we close out, Arjun, I wonder if you could tell us, is there, are there areas in this guideline of controversy that, or I guess in, in this crowd, I should say controversy, that uh, mm -hmm. you would want to highlight at all? So I think... This was somewhat alluded to by Rebecca when she started with one of the first questions that, you know, there are a number of different guidelines across the different associations and they have a lot of similarities, but there are some, some differences. We've tried to synthesize what's gone before and we've also tried to bring in some of the latest data, such as the SACO trial, which was published very recently where, you know, GLS uh, has a role to play. And one of the other things that we were keen to do was given that it was a British Society of Echo guideline, have it allied to the rest of the British Society of Echo guidelines. So the definitions that we've used are based on the British Society of Echo guidelines, so it is consistent with those. But the rest of the guideline hopefully should not be too controversial. Um, it is, of course, evidence-based, and we've tried to make it as practical as possible so that it does benefit uh, physiologists performing the scans and that it's also quite easily readable by oncologists and um, anyone interested in this field. And is this getting some good readership? Yeah, so I think the thing is it was good because... Um, uh, the, the Jack Cardio Oncology, um, you know, helped spread the word and it was, you know, simultaneous publication in Echo Research and Practice as well. So that's a, um, you know, UK based uh, Echo Journal, the journal of the, the British Society of Echo. So that is a fairly wide readership within the UK. So I think the yeah. combined, um, you know, joint publication, you know, made a difference and um, really allowed us to reach some, you know, readership that maybe, you know, wouldn't have been the case. So really on, on Twitter, you can kind of see that, uh, you know, people from, you know, all around the world um, really have been messaging. Oh, and I forgot to say that the Twitter message that you tagged me in, um, you didn't tag me, you tagged somebody else. So similar. <laughs> oh, no. Similar. So, uh, 
they, they must be wondering that they're getting lots of uh, you know hits on this. But uh, yeah, no, but, but, but buzz from around the world, yeah. Sorry about that. My my social media <laughs> skills are clearly lacking. Yeah. Easily done. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very, very similar. I think you missed out by one letter, so I can understand easily done. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you retweeted it. Well, congratulations again on a great piece of work, and thank you for uh, the effort that you put into this. I think this is going to be a great help in pushing the practice of cardio-oncology forward, not only in the UK, but as Arjun mentioned, globally as well. And thanks to our listeners for joining today. We will put a link to this guideline in the show notes. And of course, you can find it at our website, ic-os.org, where you can also find more information about our organization, our May certification exam, any other of our activities. You can also find it at Jack Cardio Oncology. So until our next episode, stay safe, and we hope to be in touch soon.